Today on Gardening by the Yard, some gardening basics, then timber, losing an old friend, and finally dealing with a big landscaping problem. All that and more is in store, so stay tuned. Gardeners come in all ages, shapes, and sizes, and their skills vary enormously. But the gardeners I tend to admire most are those that are just discovering the joys of gardening. So in this segment, which I call Gardening 101, I'm going to present several tips aimed at helping newcomers to the world of gardening become successful gardeners. And my first tip, start a compost pile. Make no mistake, folks, compost is key in the recipe for successful gardening. Let me say that again. Compost is key in the recipe for successful gardening. In fact, it's the single most important ingredient in any garden. Compost enriches the soil, improves drainage, helps fight off pests and diseases, and makes your plants oh so healthy. Oh, you've marked the center lines already? And whether you choose to build an elaborate bin and compost on a grand scale, or place a small store-bought composter in a sunny spot in the yard, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is that you make compost. And use it, of course. Spread a thin layer over your garden beds at least once a year or mix it with the native soil when planting. Apply it as a top dressing to lawns. Top off containers with it. And use it to make compost tea. And if you can't make your own compost for whatever reason, remember you can always buy compost in a bag. Many cities across the country make and sell their own compost in bags or in bulk. Most of the time it's made from leaves and other lawn refuse collected throughout the year. Next up, maintain healthy soil. The use of compost goes hand in hand with maintaining healthy soil, but there are more things to consider. For example, try to avoid walking on the soil in established gardens, because every step compacts the soil, and compaction makes it difficult for roots to grow. So create paths between rows or in beds, or place a board on the soil adjacent to areas where you work to distribute your weight more evenly over the soil. Also, try to avoid working the soil when it's wet. Otherwise, once it dries, you'll wind up with big clumps of hard packed soil. And finally, don't overwork the soil, especially with a rototiller. Remember, good soil isn't powdery. It's a mixed bag of particles of varying sizes and shapes. Mulch. Running a close second to compost in terms of overall importance in the garden is mulch. And most of you know that I'm an absolute mulch maniac. Mulch suppresses weed growth, maintains soil moisture, stabilizes soil temperatures, and mows so much more. So do yourself a favor. Mulch everything in sight with whatever organic mulch you like. Water properly. What can I say that I haven't said a hundred times before? Don't water frequently, but for only brief periods of time. Doing so will cause plant roots to hover near the soil surface where they'll quickly dry out. Instead, deep soak each time you water. Water for long periods of time if necessary, so those roots will grow deep down into the soil. And to the extent that you're able, water early in the morning so plant leaves have a chance to dry during the day. That'll help minimize fungal diseases. And for the same reason, try to water the base of the plant rather than the foliage. Next, go native. Although I'm not a native plant fanatic, that is one who insists you should grow nothing but native plants in your landscape, there's no getting around the fact that native plants tend to be easier to grow, have fewer pest and disease problems, and require less supplemental water. As a result, if you grow a lot of native plants, you'll develop more confidence with fewer hassles. When and where you can, minimize maintenance. Every suggestion I've made so far, from composting to mulching to going native, will reduce the amount of time you have to spend in the garden. But there are two more I'd like to highlight. Cut back on the use of fertilizers and prune only when necessary. Fertilizing and pruning cause plants to produce tender succulent growth. And tender succulent growth is precisely what bugs prefer the most. Besides, who says that a plant should be forced to grow faster than its normal growth rate, or that a plant should be pruned in a fashion that, well, is radically different than the way nature intended it to grow? Well, to be honest with you, a lot of people say that. It's just that I'm not one of them. Visit your garden regularly. 
If you'll spend just 10 minutes a day wandering around your garden, say early in the morning with a cup of coffee or right after work with a, well, with a glass of iced tea, you'll quickly form an invaluable bond with everything that grows. And along the way, you might stop and pull a few weeds, spot a plant in need of water, realize that slugs or aphids are on the move, and so on. And by dealing with all those little things on a daily basis, if not every other day, you won't be so overwhelmed with garden chores by the time the weekend rolls around. In fact, by tending to the garden daily but briefly, you may find that you've got a lot more time for alternative weekend activities. And there you have it. Start a compost pile, maintain healthy soil, mulch, water properly, go native, minimize maintenance, visit your garden regularly, and finally, watch my show. Hey, I had to get out of this segment somehow, and I figured a little shameless self-promotion was as good a way as any to do just that. Coming up next, Timber! earlier today, totally unrelated to trees, my crew and I were startled by a strange, eerie crackling sound. And we turned to witness a truly amazing sight. My beautiful giant oak tree fell over, just up and fell down, and in the exact spot where my crew and I were shooting the day before. There was a crack, a boom, a thud, and then there was this. Right now, I'm just astonished in complete shock at the sheer magnitude of the damage. You know how I feel right now? <laughs> Let's see, who do I call first? <laughs> Insurance company, my favorite arborist. You know how much money this is gonna cost? I mean, this is like a big stack of money. And not just in cleanup and removal either. You see, this was more than a tree. It was an architectural feature, an enormous natural work of art that is simply impossible to replace. <laughs> the good news, of course, is that no one was injured. The bad news is, well, there's all kinds of bad news. For one thing, this was my favorite tree, and it really defined the entrance to my property. Uh, let's see, the house is damaged, the roof's got holes in it, the gutters have been ripped out, several beds are destroyed, all kinds of plants are now goners. Oh, one more thing, our producer, Teresa, her car's destroyed too. These pictures give you a clear idea of the powerful forces nature can unleash. And in this case, that force was an out of nowhere straight wind that blew this massive tree clean over taking everything in its path with it, and in the process, altering the entire look of my landscape. But now all this, what was once a shade garden, is now a full sun garden. I have to replant everything. Hmm. So just how big was this tree? Well, lighting director J.T. Graham here is probably 5'10", and he's a good three feet shorter than the tree's root ball. My guess is that she was as tall as she was old. According to my ring count, this tree is 105 years old. I think that was 105 years old. And that means I was born right here. So who's gonna clean up this mess? Well, one thing I can tell you for sure, not I. I may be the gardener guy, but there are limits to what I'm willing and able to do. And do yourself a favor, folks. For a big job like this, make sure you hire a professional tree service company, especially one that's licensed, bonded, and insured. Unless you understand what's involved in removing a tree this large, the situation can go from bad to worse in a hurry. Remove the wrong branch from the wrong place and the weight of the tree could shift, causing even more damage to the house. Now, since there are already two holes in the roof and thunderstorms are due within hours, I'm all about a well-thought-out plan by my professional arborist pals to get this job done, and get it done right. In just a minute, a 50-ton crane with an 80-foot boom will roll in here to start work. But because most driveways, including mine, simply can't support that kind of weight, the tree crew is laying plywood down to distribute the load evenly across the concrete. After the crane gets situated, it'll be followed by a chipper, which helps with the cleanup of tree debris. 
You won't hear the sound of chainsaws roaring on just any gardening show, folks. Okay, here's the plan. The crew begins by removing smaller limbs and branches. This so-called limbing helps distribute the weight safely and evenly around the tree. It also allows access to the main branches. As they're removed, the smaller branches are fed into the chipper. I say smaller, the fact is this baby can accommodate a log that's 18 inches in diameter. Just chews it up and spits it out. Section by section is removed and hoisted high in the air, always with the goal of protecting the property from further damage. You know, being the kind of guy that likes to look for the silver lining in things, well, at least I know that I've got plenty of firewood for years and years and years to come. Some people might hope to find the silver lining in more tangible terms, say their insurance policy. Now, let me tell you something, folks. In situations like this, insurance issues can get a little tricky, and policy coverage can vary enormously. One of the first calls I made was to my insurance agent to find out what my policy does and doesn't cover. Now, the oak smacked my house pretty good on its way down, and it uplifted sidewalks and portions of my driveway, which means it damaged permanent structures. As a result, I'll be able to recoup a good portion of my losses. But get this. Generally speaking, had there been no damage to the home or structures of any kind, chances are my coverage would be limited to debris removal only. Could have been a whole lot worse. Now I can smell the rain coming this way, and I'd say the guys have only a few hours tops to wrap things up. But having witnessed their progress up to this point, I have no doubt that they'll finish before the skies bust open. Well, almost anyway. Actually, no sooner do the guys finish getting the last hunks of tree trunk removed from the top of the car than the next force of nature rains down from the skies with every bit as much power as my fallen oak. So they break for lunch and return in an hour to clearer skies, at least temporarily. The work continues, and just before sundown, they finish the task, leaving nothing behind but a bit of sawdust and, for me, the lasting memory of that once mighty oak. Next on Gardening by the Yard, what do I do now? I think I can save the branch with a little tree surgery. Always the optimist. And finally, dealing with a big landscaping problem, so stay tuned. The tree is gone, and after having dealt with a range of emotions from astonishment to helplessness to anger, it's time to assess the damage to my landscape plants. Now, basically, my plan is to save those plants that can be saved and protect those that need protection. My first stop is here at this Japanese maple, which definitely has seen better days. Actually, as bad as it looks right now, it looked a lot worse last week. In fact, I thought it was a goner because the weight of the fallen tree had forced the branches of this baby to the ground. In and of itself, this is a prized maple, and replacing it would run into the thousands of dollars. But because it's part of a matched pair, it's doubly important to me. Now, the symmetry on the backside of the tree has been destroyed due to the loss of a rather large branch. And as you saw earlier, yet another branch has been damaged considerably, and that damage extends all the way down to the trunk of the tree. However, I think I can save the branch and repair the damage to the trunk with a little tree surgery. What I'm going to do is trim the bark and some of the interior wood in such a way that I encourage the tree to callus, or heal, if you will. And to do that, I'll use a very sharp grafting knife to basically clean up the wounds. Where the outer bark is separated from the interior wood, I'll make a clean cut back to where the bark is still attached. I'll also clean up any ragged edges along the way. This is a slow process, but with any luck, the bark should begin to grow over the inner wood.